Yeah. I think we have a quorum. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Thanks uh, for coming to the afternoon session. So again, we have two sessions, so uh, learning session and then causality. Um, so the session, we have four talks. The first talk is by Richard. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Richard Go. Um, I'm a research associate with Institute of the Laboratory at the University of Cambridge. In the meantime, I'm a research fellow here at Simmons, my office 318. Uh, I got my PhD in statistics from the University of Washington last year. And my thesis was about likelihood analysis of causal models. Uh, and uh, I, I do want to say that my hair usually looks better when I'm on vacation. Um, so uh, I just want to you know, show you some pictures. And I guess I want to convince you through an example that the current methods towards causal discovery, whereas you use some score and you pick the one well, I guess the score base, mainly. Uh, you pick the one with the highest score, that type of approach can be problematic. And, and I'm trying to illustrate with a simple example. Let's just say, look at the simplest example that we want to choose between two graphical models. One is the Clatter model, which implies one and two are marginally independent. The other one is the conditionally independent model, uh, which is, you can draw that as a chain or a fork, their equivalent. Uh, the conditional independence is one independent of two given three. So assume, let's just assume, uh, we know one of them must hold and the variables are jointly Gaussian. Now, if we take a geometric view of what the two models they want to select from, well, those correspond to algebraic constraints on the covariance matrix. Well, it suffices just to look at the correlations for simplicity, right? If I draw the correlations at three axes, one, two, two, one, three, and two, three. The margin independent model, it just says one or two margin independence. So this one, row one, two axis must vanish. So that's represented by this gray plane. Okay, the other model condition independence model. Um, the conditional independence relation can be written as this uh, equation. If you draw it, it's this checkerboard uh, hyperbolic parabola. So um, we, we, when we have sample, I want to differentiate between the two models. I'm, I'm telling you that this is not always easy because they intersect and they intersect, you know, uh, through the two axes on the plane and they further intersect at the origin. So basically, if you just do a score based approach, you just pick the one with a higher BIC, then when the two, when one of the, when, when you're close to one of the axes, you basically, you know, you're as good as flipping a coin randomly. So uh, we can look at the model a little bit carefully, sort of like a ratio test. You know, basically um, there are two different regimes that makes it's the hard, makes it hard to differentiate between the two. One regime is, you know, consider the set of laws that converge to a point on the axis. You know, and this is kind of the nice thing, nice regime that I would call, because, you know. Um, at the intersection point, locally, the two models are as if you are intersecting two, two planes or two lines. And if you're rooting away from origin, that means you're rooting away from one model to the other. Um, okay, so this is the kind of the nice one, but more interesting one is where you think about your sampling distribution is, you know, in the vicinity of the origin. Now, if you do that, uh, the strange behavior is that if you are rooting away from the origin, actually, you get one over n away from one model to the other. Okay, what this implies is that even if your effect size as measured by this distance from the origins, one over root n, you cannot differentiate between the two models. Okay, there is a more uh, information theoretic analysis that basically says this fact size is controlled by the product of the two axes on the plane, by the two rows on the plane, where we basically compare this quantity to whatever root n. Uh, so as you all know very well, uh, you know, like when they are faster than a root n, then uh, it's not distinguishable. When they're asymptotically bigger than root n, they're distinguishable. The interesting regime is where they are comparable with one over root n. Well, then here comes my criticism with the type of score-based approach uh, for which the consistency usually relies on some strong faithfulness assumptions. Now, suppose I impose strong faithfulness and say, you know, 
to differentiate model, I always bound row away from zero. And specifically, we want all the rows to be bounded away from one over root 10. But that means if we, our sampling distribution is in this regime, is near the origin, the distance between models is actually one over n, right? You still do, cannot differentiate between these two models, even if you assume the type of strong faithfulness that seems to bound every row, okay? So this is, this is a bit like, you know, even if you think all the effect sizes are strong, but the models can be actually quite close to each other in this forest of DAGs. Um, uh, so actually, we developed a proposal that's less aggressive in the sense that we allow a third option when you select between the two models. The third option is being saying, basically saying, you know, I cannot differentiate between models. In terms of DAG selection, that's type of decision rule that allows you to report not a single model, but a collection of models. Okay, and another aspect is that uh, this decision basically look at the likelihood ratio test, you know, and compare it with some threshold C alpha. If it is positive, it's bigger than the positive value of the C alpha, you can you can commit to one model. If it is smaller than negative value of the same threshold, you commit to the other model. Anything in between, I just say, I don't know. Um, and the C alpha uh, is actually a bit uh, funny as well, because uh, I didn't mention, but basically the asymptotic distribution could depend on how and where the sample distribution converged to, uh, to the axis or to the origin, and also depends on where, uh, how it converges. So if you take all those asymptotic distribution and take a proper envelope, then that envelope could be used to do, formulate uh, these critical values that is valid for all possible regimes. Um, so, so as I said, I'm interested in this type of problems, uh, model selection with confidence and less stringent, stringent assumptions um, about causal models. There are also some other stuff I'm interested in, like semi-parametric theory of graphical models and algebraic aspects of graphical models. And we have a weekly reading group at 1 p.m. on Monday. Everybody's welcome. I'm also inter interested in information theory and patch identification. Okay, I want to thank you very much. So we have time for questions. Thanks for staying on time. Oh yeah. If you're in a situation where you can't choose between these DAGs, mm -hmm. is there the possibility that if you extend your model class beyond course with sufficient DAGs, you might be able to Go for something else. Do you know what I mean? Is uh, the problem that you're restricting to DAX? It could. It could be that. Uh, it could be that. Yes. So, um, I guess if you just choose DAX in a nested fashion, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have this problem. But if you want choosing models that are non-nested, mm -hmm. then at the intersection they have this problem that the local geometry <laughs> might not like. Uh, usual Euclidean or normal uh, local geometry and we have this problem. So I'm not sure. I think if you're always comparing to a bigger model, you don't have this problem, but I'm not sure by introducing more models that would resolve okay. this issue. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering if you could if you could say again what the the um, what you said about strong faithfulness. So in the strong faithfulness setting, you're ruling out that intersection. You're bounding away from it because you if at the intersection of those two dependent models, you have a faithfulness violation. So if you have strong faithfulness, you're like have to be some delta away from that intersection. So I, was I wasn't sure I understood what you said about right. that. So strong faithfulness saying you basically want to bound all the rows, you know, non-zero rows away from zero, right? But how large is that threshold? Well, it is inherently always compared to the sample size. And we think, usually think, one over root n is the correct sample size, right? It should be asymptotically bigger than one over root n. But that still does not ensure these two models are different, are distinguishable from each other. 
I see, but if you allow that boundary to be like or large, larger than whatever root n, then yeah, then, then then you have to basically enumerate all the possible intersections, compute the curvature, and say you know, but the curvature could be pretty high. I mean, this is uh, like square, but sometimes it could be to the higher power. So it makes those assumptions less plausible, I would say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.